Today is March 15, 2024. I'm here at the village in Gainesville with Edith Blaylak and my name is Agnieszka Ilwicka Karuna. Behind the camera is Deborah Hendricks. We are part of the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program at University of Florida. Edith Blaylak, do I have your permission to record this interview? Sure, yes. Thank you very much. We would like to start uh, with asking you about your earliest memory from your childhood. I remember being in my crib and um, my mother and her sister were in the kitchen, which was the next room at that time from where my brother and I slept. And um, they were gonna have shrimp salad and I wanted it. And, I said, I was too young to have shrimp salad. It just sounded so delicious and I couldn't imagine, but if they were having it, I knew it was good. But, and I remember a nightmare that I've had in that crib that I had a number of times through the years. What was there in this nightmare? Um, well, in the one side of the, I, from my crib, I could see through the kitchen to a, a window on one side and, um, it looked over some garage roof. And I imagined there was some kind of terrible creature there in that window. I don't know why anything would have scared me, but it did. And so anyway, I guess I was a scaredy cat. Um, can you describe the physical space of your home? Um, back then? Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. Oh, uh, we lived, my parents rented a flat. This was during the war, World War II. They rented a flat and rented out two rooms to roomers because we had a bunch of bedrooms in that flat. And um, my parents both worked. Sometimes the roomers paid their rent by babysitting with my brother and me. He's 20 months younger. Um, it had a long hall from the front door. Well, it was a big brick building with a couple lived upstairs in a long hall that went the length of the, of the um, apartment flat. And um, to, to one side, there was a living room with pocket doors and then my parents' bedroom and then the, what should be the dining room. But when we had um, rumors, my brother and I used the dining room for our sleeping quarters. It was a large, large, almost the largest room in the house. And we always ate in the kitchen anyway. And the kitchen was in the back and the other side and then a nice large white tile bathroom. Um, and then um, two bedrooms that the uh, roomers used, a big porch in the front. My parents, well, when I was small, my parents put me out on, on the front porch in a playpen where I'd get fresh air while mother was doing her chores. And their dog that my dad had before they were married would sit by that playpen and make sure I was fine. If an, even a fly went by, that scared me and he got it. So he, he looked after me. That dog was, they had for a long time and uh, then he, some neighbors put glass in uh, ground beef and killed him. Now, he never went anywhere, bothered anybody. He sat on that porch with me or whatever. So, but anyway, somebody wasn't happy. Um, anyway. What year was that? In the 30s. I would have been well, 37, 38, around in there. Probably 38, because I don't think we moved to that flat until my brother was born and they needed more space. Otherwise, before that, they had a, a smaller apartment. And oh, yes, and when my brother was born, my mother's sister moved in with us to help out. And, um, and, what, what year and when and where were you born? Okay, I was born in Racine, Wisconsin, May 1st, 1935. 
when I was six weeks old, my parents moved to Erie, Pennsylvania because jobs were scarce for men. Uh, and my dad heard about a job in Erie. And when he got there, there was the job was gone. But his mother and his stepfather were living there, and we lived in their attic. And they made an apartment up there and um, until my dad could get find a stu some work. And uh, my st grandfather was a doctor, and he treated me like I was a princess. It was he was really special in my life. I didn't know my dad's father because he passed away when when my dad was in his teens. So. But they were really good to me. Mm -hmm. What were your parents' names? Helen Yosko Matthews and Kenneth George Matthews. And my mother was born in Racine, just so happens, and my father in Erie. So, but my dad met my mother. Mother had a, came from a very large Polish family. Her, her mother and older siblings were born in Poland. And um, so with all, she had a lot of brothers and my dad had met her brothers and that's how he met my mother. So I've got a picture of them when they were courting and another picture of mother before she was married, and then their wedding picture. Um, and anyway, they were very good parents. We didn't know we were poor. Everybody was poor back then. It was, now they'd think it was terrible, but we didn't have to have all these things that we have now. Nobody had them, and we got along fine. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to understand uh, what does it mean to be poor? What does it mean, the poverty? Because, uh, of course, everybody had the same, but what does it mean to have something versus not to have something? Well, oh my, I mean, I'm looking back saying poor back then. I didn't think so. Um, my clothes generally came from relatives. Uh, my um, my father's sister was also married to a doctor, and they were better off. And anyway, I got some of their their daughter's clothes. I got um, other family members. We got their swing set, their bike, their. You know, all these things that my parents were doing well just to provide a home and and the basics for us. So I didn't know I was poor or lived in a poorer neighborhood um, until I went with my dad to go see somebody that he worked with. And I always rode along with my dad. We, and uh, I saw a girl I knew from school, so I started to walk over to her yard to, to play with her, and her father said, no, no, you can't play with her. She lives over a poor section. And that startled me. And, you know, I said, whoa, what's wrong? I'm just like her, you know. But anyway, I didn't realize the effect that had on my life till later remembering it, because for years I forgot about that incident. And so, I thought, you know, he's probably the poor man with his narrow thoughts. But anyway. Yeah, but back then you were stopped from having friendship relations. I did, but I, with her. And maybe we did again in school when he was, I don't know. But um, I had, I, I was more social than my brother. And I kind of roamed the neighborhood, and had friends all over the area. and. It worked out for me. My brother was happier staying at home. He was not as that. He wasn't outgoing. So he still isn't. But that's okay. I took care of my little brother. 
I, well, I still do. <laughs> <laughs> what languages were spoken at your home? Okay. Um, of course, mother went to a Catholic school. Well, at home, they spoke Polish in her, as she grew up. They kept their language in the house. And she spoke, well, she had to learn Latin in the Catholic schools. Um, but English, they were only to speak English when they walked out that door. They were Americans. They wanted to assimilate. They, they kept their own culture in the home, but they wanted to be Americans. So that's not the way it is now. Maybe, maybe for you, but a lot of, um, well, but the poor Cubans that came to South Florida, because I was living there during part of that, um, we had to change our language and culture for them. We had to know Spanish. So my mother, I was in high school, my mother went back to school to learn Spanish, which was simple for her because she'd already had three languages, um, so that she could hold a job. Um, they, on the doors of the business, some businesses would say, we also speak English. But I feel sorry for the Cubans, so I'm not picking on them, but I'm just saying that things are done differently now, um, or at least they were in Florida. So, so I, when I had to have a language in college, my Spanish was not that good. <laughs> I took reading French and got by. I would like to ask you about the culture because you mentioned that uh, there was there were kind of two sides. One was the one that was kept at home mm -hmm. and another was the out of home uh, presence and appearance for others. So what elements of the uh, Polish tradition you remember from your home? Well, because I wasn't around my grandmother that much Maybe the food that when my um, mother's sister would be with us, maybe the food they prepare, prepared was different. Now, my father had stomach trouble and he could only eat plain food. That's what he was brought up on. And so she could only do that when he was at work or, you know, or something because she needed to prepare food for my dad that he could, he could eat, so. Um, but of course, the Catholic faith, that was part of their tradition. And uh, I was raised initially Catholic because my father was Protestant. And when he married my mother, he had to sign that my bro if they had children, that they would be raised in the Catholic Church, in which we were until we were about, about 11. I was about 11. So. And what changed at the age of 11? Well, we moved to Miami, Florida, and I thought I had gone to heaven because there was sunshine and flowers blooming all year long. And in Erie, Pennsylvania, it was very dreary. It was, you had the soot from the factories everywhere. It was gray. Um, even the snow didn't take long for it to be covered with soot. So it was just a different climate totally and um, uh, then uh, because my father's family was also in Miami and my dad had lived there some as the, a young man before he got married um, they were Protestants so we went to the Protestant church and and that way my father went to church because when we were going to the Catholic church he stayed at home or he worked so I think those were the most that I can remember. Now, mother wore her hair, long hair, and she had braids on top of her head. And some of the words she used for things, but she finally got her hair cut. Well, actually, she had short hair when she met my dad because those pictures, she had short hair, but through the years, she let it grow. The neighborhood kids would come over on Saturday and wash, watch her wash her hair and comb it. She was washing her hair outside, right? No, in, in the house, in the bathroom, but 
not in the shower, in the sink. Like now, we wash our hair in the shower, but back then, I think we only had a bathtub back then. I'm sure that's all we had. Do you remember what was she using to take care of her hair? No. Hadn't thought of that. I don't know. And you, when you were washing your hair at home, when you were growing up? Well, when mother washed it, it was in the bathroom sink because we always had a tub. We never had a shower, I think, until till we moved to Florida in 1946. That's the first time we had a shower, and then we washed our hair in the shower. Mm -hmm. And when she was washing your hair, you remember how, like, what was she using? No. No, I, I remember she used Fels naphtha to do the laundry, but I don't think she used that on our hair. But she had beautiful hair. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were talking a little bit about the food. Do you remember any specific uh, dishes? Like, for example, Gawompki. You know, I don't remember any of the names. I know she fixed them. Um, when my older son would visit with me, she would fix. Oh, no, I can't think of what it's called, but it's not traditionally Polish, I don't think, but it's potatoes and cabbage and the sausage, uh, kielbasa. So she she fixed that, but I think, I'm not sure that's just Polish. But other things I don't remember. How, uh, how did you celebrate Christmas? Oh, well, Uh, when we moved to, no, when we were in Erie, okay, um, they put the Christmas tree up the night before. We didn't see it. They put it up after we were in bed, my brother and I. Uh, and they had pocket doors. Well, the, the living room had pocket doors to the hall and a regular door to their bedroom. Um, so they could go in there quiet, quietly to and set it up, and our presents were under the tree. And in the morning, we didn't have breakfast till my grandparents came. We had breakfast together, and then we all opened our presents together. Nowadays, family, nuclear families, keep their little group together, and the relatives, the grandparents, are not part of that. I miss it, but that's life now, so. So some of the traditions are, are gone, at least in my family. Mm -hmm. And what food did you have around Christmas? You know, I can't, I can't tell you for sure. Isn't that something? The tree and the presents were the, the thing that I remember back then. Now, I remember later on, when we moved to Miami, there was a turkey, and we we celebrated with my dad's sister and her family, all of us together. And when their mother was alive, she also, I mean, she was with us too. So we had a, a big group, and there was always a turkey there. One time we were, my uncle was praying before we ate, and um, the cat got hold of the turkey and knocked it on the floor before we ate. But, and I don't remember what happened to the turkey. I don't remember what we ate, whether they took it. I, have, I just remember the incident. I even remember the cat's name, isn't that something? What was the cat's name? Pepper. That cat could open doorknobs. They had lever handles uh, in, in their house. That cat could open all the doors. Mm -hmm. And 
Do you have any knowledge of where was your father's family from? Yes, um, I have some of that information now. My um, I have pictures of the headstones of my father's parents and grandparents. I guess that is for for the two generations. So from 1821, I think, uh, oldest. So I, when we got to go, when I was an adult and older, and got to go around and, and like carrying a camera around, I took pictures of those kinds of things for memories. So where was that? In Pennsylvania. Northwestern Pennsylvania, near Erie. So they were long, long life immigrants, right? They s a couple generations. Yeah. Um, well, I know my father was ninety. I used to think that was a long life. Now, because I've got friends that are over a hundred, it, it it doesn't seem as long. But anyway, yeah. And I have no idea how old my grandmother my father's mother was because she passed when right before my daughter was born and I was not living in the Miami area. And um, I've never been able to find a trace of her where she was buried or a, an obituary or anything. And my older son has looked for it and uh, he's never found anything. To me, she was always older. She always had gray hair. She was, you know, and I, I have no clue how old she might have been. But up north after her grandpa Ross passed, um, she would spend half the year with us and half in Miami, and she had an apartment in Miami. And then when she was us, she shared um, my bedroom with me, so we were close. What what did you like about her in particular? Well, her name was Edith also. Um, maybe she treated me like an adult or an equal. Or I don't know. Oh, okay. Um, since her second husband was, was, was a doctor, he'd go to the uh, AMA meetings. And she'd go to hobnob with the ladies. And um, she wouldn't do elevators or escalators, so I got to go every place. And um, I'd be the only child there, and they'd give me a, I, when they'd go to their teas or whatever they drank, they'd set up a little table for me and give me lemonade. And I, those were all extra special times that I got treated that, anyway. And I got nice clothes. You know, she wouldn't take me in my regular clothes. I got new clothes. Um, she always took me shopping with her. Did you buy anything specific? No, if she gave me money, I mean, she bought her clothes. And she always took me with her when she went. But if she gave me money, I bought bought my brother something because she didn't ever buy him or anything. She didn't, she was of the culture. Sorry, this is not the thing to do before a camera. Um, men were not looked at the same. I'm not sure how to explain it, but she was, I don't know how she had children, let's say that. Does that make any sense? Um, She didn't spend any time with my brother. However, one time my brother and I had played outside and we'd borrowed some of my dad's tools and it started to rain and we knew we had to get in and get those tools. My, well, my brother forgot one of the tools and he, um, well, for some reason, we had a glass jar on the steps out the back door and he ran out the back door to get the dad's tools that he had left and he fell and he hurt himself all in the groin, all cut on that glass. 
And my grandmother is the one that took care of him and handled it calmly. And that's the only thing I've ever seen her do compassionately for a male. Um, her husband spoiled her rotten and he treated her. He got up, fixed breakfast, coffee, brought it to her and, you know, bed and what have you. Um, I don't know how he, how he put up with her. Anyway, those are things I'd forgotten about. Do you feel close relationship with your brother? Oh, yes. Um, I called him Monday. Um, he had his first fall. He wasn't going to tell me about it because he doesn't talk about anything with him. I know he has had cancer in the past and things like that, but his wife told me and that a nurse comes three times a week to check on him. So it must have been a pretty bad fall. But my, but his wife is has dementia and all kinds of health problems, so he can't hardly leave her. But they do live in a home all themselves and not really able to take care of it. Um, he's not real communicative, and um, so I do the calling. And now that I don't have a car and don't have a way to go and see them. I have to wait until I get somebody going that way and go visit them. How far they are from They're in Brandon, Hillsborough County. It's, there's no direct route there because the interstate and all cuts through everything. And even when I was driving, I didn't do the interstate for a long time. So. But when my late husband was living, we went to see him and, and did things with him, took him out to eat and did things. Mm-hmm. I would like to ask you about your um, education, um, but also from your parents' perspective. How important was education for them? Well, my dad always learned things. Neither one of them finished high school. But both of them learned things, like mother going back to school when I was in high school to learn, well, she learned Spanish shorthand and typing to be able to hold a job. Um, my dad was always taking extension classes and my dad played the violin, so learning and he practiced every day and probably the week he passed. Well, the week before he went to the hospital and uh, he, he practiced his violin. That was learning, that was he improving his skills. And um, yeah. He and my late husband were buddies because they were of a similar nature. Um, my husband, Harold, didn't play any instrument, didn't think he was musical, and I'm not. But um, their life history was so similar. In what sense? Well, Harold didn't finish high school either. He went into the war. And um, to have jobs like he did from learning everything, he'd take a class in something and um, be licensed in all kinds of areas to be able to hold better jobs to support his family. And because he liked learning, he was in his 80s, I think, when he took his last test, um, was um, ham radio for the top license, and I think it's a, it's a federal exam, and he passed it the first time. And I couldn't even understand what he was studying. I had my general license. I couldn't get the extra. I mean, we both learned all that. I mean, electronics to me was, I had to learn from scratch. And I don't remember, it was hard to remember any of it, but he, him, he just absorbed it. So, and my dad, same way with things. So my, well, actually, my dad was taking a class for ham radio, and at the same time we were, and we didn't know each other, we were doing it, and so it was 
kind of interesting. And so when Harold and my dad would call each other on the radio almost every night and chat. And then we moved my parents to Gainesville. They were living in Hillsborough County, moved them to Gainesville. And then they said if they moved to Gainesville, if we moved them there, if they couldn't take care of themselves, could they live with us? He says, oh, absolutely. And so we were building a house for them to live with us when my father passed. And my mother did get to come and live with us before she passed. So, How was this experience for oh, you? Oh, good. And he and my mother got along so good. And I retired early at that. Well, I had health issues. My dad never recovered from bypass surgery, but he was 90. Um, I had a heart attack the next month and had bypass surgery. Um, but anyway, um, my husband got along so well with my family that uh, it was a blessing. And with my kids, too. Actually, my youngest, I, he just considered him his father. I would like to ask you about your husband's history. Where was his family from? Okay, um, my late husband was uh, from Miami County, Ohio. And um, He had one sister. Um, she had three girls. Well, the first girl was born of her husband that died in the Battle of the Bulge, and then she remarried. But she married the first and second husband. Were, they were all in the same class in school growing up together. Anyway, uh, I'm a, I keep in contact with those three girls and their families, and they do me too. So I'm closer to them than Harold's own two kids. They've just embraced me into their family so nicely that I feel so comfortable with them. And sometimes, like, sometimes on Valentine's Day or Easter or something, they send me flowers. I just, They're special. Mm -hmm. And what was your husband's uh, family origin? Where okay. Um, the first one that we've traced back was from Jamestown. And I've got the little write-up that his niece gave me of, because she's done the searching on all that. And uh, the name has fluctuated in spelling through the years like three or four different ways. But Jamestown where? Virginia, I guess it is. Well, I'll see what she said on the. I just read it over this week. Um, but uh, I probably have more history on his family because I knew more of his family than... Um, because they didn't move that far away, a lot of them, where my family was separated. Mother had, she didn't live in Racine or Wisconsin, and, and during the war you could, you got gas coupons, uh, and that was based on your job. And so we didn't ever get to travel back there, but a couple times in my whole life. So I remember seeing my mother's mother one time, but Other than that, other than the pictures of her. When we went to visit, she pushed two chairs together, one, cha one set for me and one set for my brother to sleep. We didn't think, we thought that was pretty neat. Nowadays, they wouldn't do that to their children. Anyway, times have changed, obviously. Mm-hmm. We were, yes, we were talking about your husband's uh, family. So what was his full name? Harold Rockwell Blaylock. And his father passed before I knew the family. And, um, but his mother was an absolute delight. 
She and her sister were buddies. Her sister lived to 102. She lived, Mina, our Mina, but she was called Mina, lived to 93. And she was some lady. I mean, she, her, they kept up with history. They kept up with what was going on in the world, and especially Harold's aunt kept with, uh, up with all the sports. She didn't want people to know when she was losing her vision, she still kept getting the newspaper delivered. And she walked to church and she, and they were independent ladies. Before we started recording, you mentioned that they got education. Well, Harold's mother did. Her sister quit school and went to work in during the war in the factories. Well, I'm not sure. At one time, part of the time, yes, you worked in a factory where they worked 12 hour days, seven days a week to produce the things they needed for the war. I don't remember exactly what she did, but So whether it was bad weather and the roads were icy or what was going on, they went to work. By then she was with a widowed also. Did she talk to you about this experience? Well, yeah, and this was Harold's aunt that worked in the factory. Harold's mother stayed at home. Um, she never really worked out of the home except was a child on farm labor because they, she and her sister would do jobs that other kids wouldn't do and um, helping and planning and so forth, riding on some of that equipment you wouldn't let anybody ride on now. Um, because they were poor, and but they could work and they were fine with it, Harold's mother and his father were farmers. Um, I have a picture of the house he grew up in. We had it for a few years until we couldn't take care of it anymore and no family members wanted it, so it hurt him to sell it. But he had done all the upgrades to it we could do ourselves electrical and plumbing and all, but it needed foundation work and that. Anyway, we took care of it as long as we could. And his sister took the farmland that was part of it, so but they were farmers. His sister was a farmer and her husband. How did you meet him? Well, I'd been single a while. It was on university campus. Um, I was working in Tigert. And he was working for an architectural engineering firm that was building a building on campus. And so he walked by my desk. Um, I was in a big office. And he had to walk by my desk to go to the conference room and to see the, the people that worked there. I was secretarial. I had just finished college. And uh, I saw him, but I didn't meet him and talk to him then. But sometime later, I got another job on campus in a building that's not there anymore. And uh, then that building burned down and we moved to Peabody, I think it is. And anyway, he had to come in there and turn in reports. And my boss was a matchmaker. So we went together for five, six years. And then he didn't ask me to marry him. He went a, a roundabout way. Um, one day at lunch, well, we used to, he'd pick me up for lunch. He could, he had a pa parking decal. He could go all over campus. Mine was just right where I could park. And so we, we'd bring our lunch and eat together, maybe park over by Lake Alice and just relax because he had a big department by then. Oh, yeah, I didn't say that. He had gotten a job with the university by then, and um, he was heading up maintenance. 
he had about 120 people under him. Oh, and uh, one day he said, um, let's go get a marriage license. So we did during lunch. And then another time he said, um, would you rather have a ring, a honeymoon, or a home? Well, that was a no-brainer. I had not had a home since I lived with my parents when I was 18. And so we bought a house. But I didn't know when we were going to get married. We didn't ever talk about it. So one day he said, how about taking a um, certain day off work? He said, I've got to go to um, Aldemont Springs to take care of some business. Come ride with me. Well, we, when he'd go visit his kids, he had, had gotten in the habit, always taken me. And they lived down in uh, Orlando area. And um, so I just saw this another day, you know, see his kids and his ex-wife. Um, but he, he signed over the home he had down there to his ex-wife. He sold a piece of property. He had developed a little area of, of the property that they had bought with their home on it has been a, was a small farm and he had subdivided it into lots and was selling lots. So he had somebody bought one that day and he divided that with his ex-wife. And um, we got back home that day or got coming home and he said, why don't you call your pastor and see if he'll marry us? So knowing that the two families would never get together and my family didn't live in Gainesville and his mother being up north and her sister. Um, anyway, so I called him, Dr. Rooks, and he says, well, I normally do counseling, but since I've known you for so long, the two of you, because we'd been going to church there, um, he says, okay. So for our ceremony, we only had us, pastor and his wife, and one friend of mine who was dying of cancer, but she had us come and get her, and she got dressed, and she was there. So that was it. But 20 years later, we renewed our vows, and we had family and all. So. His Harold's family up north wondered what took him so long to get married. But once you've had a difficult marriage, it's not something you're in a hurry to do again. But he was a very kind, caring, generous man. The love of my life. Next week he'll be gone eight years. Do you miss him? I keep his picture there. Yeah. What were the things that you two liked to do together? Well, he remembered um, Well, let's see, I'm back up a little bit. He knew that I had moved so much the prior, when I was married before, and I liked roses. I, I tried to plant a rose, and then we'd move. We moved average of once a year. One year, we probably stayed one place, two years. But I never got to have roses, and my mother could always raise roses, and, and my, my dad's mother could always raise roses, so... Um, we raised roses, and um, we took up photography together and the ham radio, so we did those things together. I'm sure there's other things, but those were the major, major ones. We even did a wedding and, and we did an anniversary, but we did amateurs, totally amateurs. But we had, they asked us to do it. Did a funeral one time. 
did all kinds of things. Loved taking pictures everywhere. In fact, well, that's one of mine. Just because I like that scene, it's so relaxing to me. It wouldn't mean anything to anybody else, but I've got others that I took. And he liked to analyze his pictures. He'd put them on his computer screen and say, now, if I'd done this, if I'd done that, and that. And he always wanted people in it. I was not good at having people in mind, or at least not portrait level. Um, but he said that in his studies that you should have people in it that gave you, could tell the size and the depth and all better with, with a, a person in it. So we went a lot of places like that that we could take pictures, but we never went out of the country other than Canada. Mm -hmm. So since then, I've, I've gone to Cuba, Puerto Rico, lots of islands in South America, Central America, Panama Canal, on the village trips. But that would not have interested him. And I didn't know I'd like it either. So I didn't, I didn't miss it. Uh, we just enjoyed doing what we did together. It didn't have to be anything fancy. It just was good to be together and do things together. As a child, were you allowed to go to kitchen and participate in this daily kitchen things? Like uh, yeah, I could do, they let me do anything. Um, especially if my mother's sister was there, she just let us my brother and me go in the kitchen with her and just whatever we mixed up, she ate, or she at least it, tasted. Um, it was more that than mother was because she worked so many hours. There wasn't any relaxed time in the kitchen for her that she, well, but I did the cooking as I got to be my teens and we moved to Florida. I started doing a lot of the cooking. I was not good. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, we're very um, informal. <laughs> um, so I, I got a cookbook for a wedding gift and Betty Crocker, of course. I used that for years. That was my guide. And then uh, I wasn't that great a cook because my older son, he later got me the joy of cooking, which I still have, I think. I don't cook now. I'm so happy to have somebody else cook, shop, clean up. Was anyone uh, in your family when you were growing up amazing cook or everyone was just average? You know, I think they were probably normal. I, I hear friends talk about their families or their cooking experiences. Mine were not like that. <coughs> now, with my parents growing up, the things they did they took us to a lot of um, like one day or two day trips, historical sites so us to learn our country's history. And um, to always took a picnic lunch. We didn't go out to eat. We didn't, you know, well, picnics were fun. Um, so those were nice. What did you take for picnics? I don't know. I just remember uh, pulling up near a, in a churchyard or something and sitting there eating. I don't think it was anything fancy because my dad couldn't eat it, but um, it was just being together, doing things together. We were a close family. So how many people were in your home when you were growing up? Well, generally, it was just my parents, my brother and me. But part of the time, when we still lived up 
north. My grandmother was there part of the year. And when I was smaller, my mother's sister was there part of the time, and then a couple times there were some rumors that uh, stayed there. Um, but normally, it was the four of us. I mean, we the house in Miami was tiny. I mean, I thought it was big. It was a two-bedroom, tiny bedrooms. One bath, tiny little closets. Well, we didn't have that many clothes anyway. What do you need a big closet for? Um, a little living room porch and a little dining room off the living room and a little kitchen just to work in, not to eat in. Um, so four people were just comfortable in there. Do you remember who were your neighbors? Yeah, different times. I remember the addresses and the phone numbers of some of our houses through the year. When we first moved to Miami, there weren't that many numbers in your phone number. Well, now I think we have to do about 10 digits. I think when we moved to Miami in 46, there were six numbers. And then they added another, and then now you know, it's and now there's new area codes popping up all all over, and you have no idea where they are. Mm -hmm. But neighbors, I remember the neighbor when Harold and I got married and bought this nice house, and it was in Hague, and which is part of Alachua. Ray and Marie Harper moved in next door to us and Mrs. Baker on the other side. What changes did you observe in Florida over the years of your time here? In 46, I mean, of course, I was a child and, and growing up and experiencing more things, but it just seemed like it was, Miami was a quiet, pretty place. People, the traffic was not horrendous. In fact, I learned to drive in Miami. It wasn't that bad. Um, people were kind. Now, uh, I'm glad I'm not driving. Um, traffic's terrible now, and I and going. I I don't want to go down to Miami and. Uh, I may have a couple second cousins or third cousins still down there, but um, the traffic has just gotten so bad, and the streets are not, they don't have English names. Um, people aren't kind. That changed, and I'm, you know, I don't know whether it's because the city got so crowded but, and then the trees and the flowers disappeared for concrete and asphalt and tile roofs, so heat. I didn't know this, the heat so much as, as it is now with all that. No trees compared to what we had, or even grass or anything. You could go to the beach. It wasn't crowded with hotels on the water. Um, I think that was something that bothered me, seeing them, um, the counties or whoever, allowing the property to be sold on the beach waterfront and putting up those big buildings. I know it's for tax money and all that kind of stuff, but I think it ruined a lot of things. I think we lost more than we gained, but I guess maybe the money is not my consideration like it was theirs. Miami was a nice place. I could ride my bike all over the place and my parents wouldn't have to worry about me. 
I wouldn't let anybody go anywhere and my kids now. Ah, well, well, my daughter, we lived back there, off, lived there off and on on my first marriage, and I'd take my daughter to the elementary school for, I don't know, it was about sixth grade, fifth, uh, somewhere in there. There were drug dealers around the school. I mean, it was, and then my son was in uh, junior high school, and there were, they'd have knives hidden, hidden in the doors and all kinds of crime that wasn't there when I was growing up. And I went to the same junior high school. And then my high school, when I took Harold back to show him where I went to high school in Miami, there's fences around there, guard at the door. The guard was not gonna let us in so I could show him inside. Finally he did, but we didn't have guards. We didn't, didn't have security police. It wasn't necessary. There may have been some vandalism, some kids did things, but it was so unusual that we didn't even know it. Crime was not the thing back then. But I've seen Gainesville grow too, so. Yeah, can you, can you I, describe well, more? Well, I think when, I don't know how many thousand students the university has now, but I think that I heard way back that there were 10,000 residents in Alachua County in one year back. And I'd lived in the general area since, oh, probably before the 70s. So it, it's changed. You could drive around university campus too. Back then you could drive around Gainesville, now places that are one-way streets and little burgs. Well, my younger son's wife was here a couple years ago. She had gone to graduate school here, and she said, you want to ride around with me? I said, absolutely, because I don't know what's going on. And we went all kinds of neighborhoods, like where she rented a room while she was in graduate school, and she took me to, what was that place? We got diced coffee down near the Hippodrome. Got a lady's name to it, where she used to go and study. Got to go to all these places that were part of her life before she was in our life. And um, it was a treat, but what, what changes? Now they've got buildings on the sidewalk. And they said, oh, well, it wasn't supposed to be that way, but it's already built, so we can't do anything about it. Who was watching what? That's those buildings near campus. Used to be a lot of trees on campus. Used to be a lot of trees in Gainesville. They're going too, which I, I think hurts our, not only our climate, but yes, I think it hurts our health too. Yeah, the pollen's bothering me right now, but that's minor. You must be about using up your time. Oh no, this is very important. I, I mean, I have no idea what time it is, but I, <laughs> it seems like I've been talking for a long time. Once I get talking and I go off on Tangents. No, no, we are talking about everything that actually is important and it does matter. And climate change is a real thing. So part of my question is also just to document what you remember um, and what you observed and what you experienced and also what are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, I think, I think we've had climate change since the beginning of time. 
but I don't think we're doing ourselves any good by some of the things we're doing. I mean, all the plastics we dispose of. Um, if we go here to the dining room and get takeout, all these plastic things, you know, and uh, so I, I don't buy bottle, bottled water. I do my own, um, a lot of things that way. I carry my own carry out containers in my walker, which I use a walker when I go across campus. I have my own carry out containers and things that I could wash and reuse. I think there's a lot of things we can do, but there's everything it's disposable. Well, you can't fix it in the trash it goes, get a new one. That's not right. Things aren't made to last. So what are we gonna do with all that garbage? I guess they tried dumping it in the ocean or putting it out on bar, anyway. You gotta do something with the trash. I mean, Alachua County sends theirs out of the county to bury it. We're gonna run out of space and what is it doing to the soil? I lived in um, Homeland, Florida. You probably never heard of it. I didn't either before I went there. Lived there a year. They mined phosphate all around that community. Right up to the property lines, they dug straight down. And the year we were there, people were getting cancer, cancer, cancer. Now they know that that came from the phosphate. So what else are we doing to ourselves? Wow. I would like to come back to something that we uh, that we only began to talk about just before we started the recording, which is the fact that Harold, your late husband, he was a war veteran. And you said a couple of important uh, things about uh, this experience. So can we just come back to our conversation sure. from that time? Um, Harold had been a POW in World War II. Um, he was captured at the Battle of the Bulge and, and um, they marched them and then trucked them by train to Germany and where they housed them. His experience through all that and losing half of his weight and during the Battle of the Bulge probably, well, they had no, they ran out of food, they ran out of ammunition, they were still in summer clothes and that was in the, a bad winter. So all that time they were trucked, transported, whatever, packed in, paddle, packed in cattle cars where um, if they tried to sit down or something, they'd get crushed. I mean, there, there was no sanitation. They got stopped once and they got a drink of water and a piece of bread. Um, the Germans in the prison camp and in Germany, the, they didn't have food either. And so they had nothing to feed the prisoners. Uh, so they dropped like flies of disease there was water, one water spigot in this huge building is all, and there was no sanitary facilities at all. They were eating out of their helmets if they still had a helmet, um, and still in their summer clothes, what was left of them, uh, and split sleeping on the ground, and then they got um, logs that they made bunks out of but they died from disease and malnutrition and whatever. And so he was blessed to be liberated uh, when the forces came in to liberate them. They were so out of it, they didn't know what was going on. At least that's the way he, he felt. His mind was so out of it. Um, they hadn't eaten, they hadn't anything um, uh, of substance. 
they tried to, the Germans tried to make soup for them out of grass, sawdust, a potato for a huge pot of soup for whatever nutrition they could give them. Um, they were not treated nicely by some. Uh, others were compassionate. Um, they knew if they tried to escape, they'd be killed, so it wasn't worth it because some did try. Um, anyway, so the the Germans fled when they saw that they were going. The camp was going to be liberated. They they all disappeared, and it took a very long time to get them out. Um, they had to take. They had well. The government had to. Well, our government and the Allies had to fix places to take them to planes could come in. Well, they had to de-lice de them. They had to do all kinds of things and give them clean clothes. So they got sprayed with DDT. Um, and they had to get them strong enough to get them on a plane to take them wherever they were going to take them to medical facilities. But their experiences being packed in the cattle cars and marched and in the prison camp, Harold didn't really talk about. That was not a subject of conversation. I knew he had nightmares. Um, but when, after he retired, he worked till he was 74. He knew that as, keeping his mind busy was the best thing for him. Um, so when he retired, we started going to XPOW reunions, and he started talking with other men that had been there and found out that what he remembered of his experiences were accurate. They weren't hallucinations or whatever. And that validated his feelings and helped him, I think, in a way to deal with them better. Um, it sounds strange saying knowing they're true and then dealing with it better. I mean, he still had some nightmares, but we could deal with them better. And um, they didn't go to the VA when they first, well, first of all, they didn't have an exit exam. There were too many men uh, being signed out of the military. They didn't need them anymore. And... Um, so there were no medical records. I mean, somebody checked some boxes somewhere, but they didn't know. And then the VA was so overwhelmed, um, that was not a place to go. And the, and the VA didn't know what to do with PTSD. They didn't know what it was anyway. So they were so overwhelmed, they couldn't care for these men. So Harold didn't get any care until probably his 70s when... Um, I'm not sure. We met somebody or something said that they're doing a POW protocol exam and, and the VA is going to take care of them. So then he he went for that and started getting some help, but they still didn't. It's hard for somebody to know what to do about something they haven't experienced, even no matter how hard they try and how well intended they are. One of his doctors was from Poland. And he's the one that marked on the map when I showed him a copy of my maternal grandmother's um, birth certificate. He showed me on the map where it was. Um, anyway, there were some nice doctors that, you know, tried, but they gave, just gave medication. And actually, the medication they gave him not knowing any better, hindsight and experience, was not something to give to older people, nor for long term. And, and he was on something for too long that was not doing good things to his brain, too. Now, 
they didn't know any better. They didn't do it on purpose. They, they were trying to be helpful. So I can't blame anybody for what he went through, but seeing, you know, what they go through is, is just not good. What kind of experience was it for you? Well, to see him struggle was really hard. He was such a good, kind, gentle person. Um, and it takes its toll. But I mean, I'm glad I could take care of him, keep it at home. Um, he stayed at home until the last two days, and he he was he did have hospice care coming in. They checked him periodically because the VA sent it. They asked me, and yeah. Um, well, we had raised our roses to take to visit people in the hospital, hospice, nursing homes, and all. So we had been to hospice facility, and he knew what it was like. And um, finally, two days before he passed, he said, I'm, I'm ready to go there. And, you know, for him to know, he was going on, going through more than I was aware of to know when his time was, and he wanted my daughter there with me. So she was. In academia, we have multiple discussions on the consequences of the Second World War. But on the very human level, I'm always wondering about the spouses of uh, people that went through uh, experience as soldiers, uh, wives, children, parents, and the general effect uh, of the war and that doesn't apply necessarily only to the Second World War, but the other oh, wars any, too. Oh, any, absolutely. Yeah. Um, this, this experience is universal. I, I aged tremendously during those couple years. Looking back, I didn't know. I mean, you can do it minute by minute, not even day by day, to try and take care of them and help them feel better. Um, I studied sociology, so I, I'm aware of, you know, some of the ways of looking at some of those things. Um, but I see friends now, I've got two friends who have their husbands who were not in the war, um, are not in a war. And their husbands are in critical nursing, I think you call it, at Okamic, and what they're going through. And they're going through it. I see one of my friends is losing so much weight. And her husband's Content. He's in ambulatory. He's in his own world. He's in a wheelchair, but he can scoot it all over the place. And the other one, her husband is bedfast, but he knows her. They're going through a terrible time, too. I mean, I, I'm not sure you can isolate it. Um, I mean, yes, Harold had nightmares through our marriage, but we learned, I learned how to calm him. You just learn minute by minute how to help. It's just, it's a learning experience. Everything's a learning curve in life. So. What was your recipe for calming down nightmares? I don't know. Well, prayer, uh, just being soft and kind of calming, kind, and 
because I had no clue to start with what to do. You just have to kind of make it up as you go along. But he, he was a Christian and he believed in prayer and that was so helpful, dealing with anything because we lost one of his daughters too while he was still living and another one had cancer but she didn't pass till last year. Um, but those affect everything, you know. So we'd calm the one daughter that had cancer. She'd call in the middle of the night when she was having a tough time and we'd talk calmly to her and pray. I'd, she'd want me to pray with her. And uh, we got her through the first time. And then when 9-11 happened, the same girl had trouble. And that's how we handled it, I guess just talking calm and praying with them. What happened during the 9-11? When the planes hit the New York City and the, Pen well, and the Pentagon in Washington and the other plane went down. Mm -hmm. But for your family in particular? No, not, not directly anybody. I know people that saw it happen. Um, one was teaching school and looked out her school classroom window and in New York area and saw the plane hitting the tower. But it, that affected an awful lot of people, not my family that, you know, in particular. I mean, not physical. They weren't involved in it, but it still, it affected everybody. I imagine it did around the world, in fact, I, to think it, that could happen. I know my hair was cut to have down. I've worn long hair. During COVID, I didn't get it cut. It was long, almost to my waist in the back. And I just got it cut last week and it was cut to wear down, but I'm not used to that. I was wearing a ponytail over my shoulder until last week. And so trying to keep my hair out of my face. <laughs> anyway. Speaking of COVID, I would like to ask you what kind of experience was it for you? Well, being here, we were fortunate. Yes, we were isolated, but the, they brought food to us once a day. We'd go to the door with our mask on and they had, somebody would come and bring our mask, the only person we saw all day. Uh, we could go out, I mean, here I could go out and walk that's okay. Um, people in the apartment buildings maybe had it a little worse because they didn't want to meet somebody in the hallway. Uh, I could sit on my porch or walk. Um, but not going to the dining room, not going to social activities, that's tough. If I had been in my home before we moved here, I would have been so isolated because I was on an acre one side was an empty lot, and then other people, and then the people on one, the other side worked. The empty lot across the street. Not, there's no empty lots there now. Um, but I would have been all alone. Um, people couldn't come visit us. They, uh, family could shop, well, the village shopped for us if we wanted to. Family could bring uh, groceries or whatever to security, and they delivered them. Uh, but just being in and being isolated like that, that's uh, hard for anybody. And I didn't get COVID until a year ago, December of 22, after the big scare was over. And a friend called me yesterday, he's got COVID here on campus. Now it's hopefully, now when he had it before and it was after the COVID scare, he he was really bad and he was, ended up in the hospital. And I did have a friend that almost didn't live, was in the hospital then, but um, my COVID was 
hit hard for a day or two, and then it was gone. And now, because I had seen that other friend, I tested last night before I went out. And I'm going to test in a couple more days, um, just because I don't want to spread it. I mean, you know, if we get COVID here, <clears throat> we report it, <clears throat> they'll have our meals delivered for us and so forth. So, But I think most people with a home test, they're not telling. It's my guess. Or they don't know. Because the home tests that a lot of us got are outdated now. But if, if they've got plenty of the fluid left in them, I had one pack or two packs that the fluid was about evaporated, and they, that's no good. But I do have some good ones. I know a flu, uh, the flu you can catch too from somebody, so we all have masks we can wear if we feel we have something. And every once in a while, we'll see some of the staff wearing masks and figure. Well, Are you vaccinated? Oh, yes. I've known people that won't get vaccin vaccinated. But yeah, we're going to have another round of vaccination here um, as soon as the health department uh, gets ready for us. They're, we're on the list. We get the rounds of that here and the flu shots every year or whenever they're ready. Oh, yeah, I wouldn't go without it. But I've got family members that... That's okay. That's their choice, I, I guess. But I see what happens with children in school when the parents won't get the vaccinations for their kids. Saw what polio did to kids before we had the vaccine. And I know somebody that had polio, and now it is older age has come, some of it, it's not the full polio's back, but some of the problems from it are back. Anyway, I think the vaccines are a good thing. I know there's a lot of negative about whatever is going on. You just have to sort through it. Thank you for sharing your opinion on this subject. Um, Deborah, do you have any questions? Okay, I have one. Why did you choose the village? Okay, that's a good question. We went and checked around to, we went to the atrium, we went to Oak Hammock. And we chose, we didn't want our family to choose for us. Because no matter what one side, one side said, the other side's going to say the opposite. We knew that. We didn't want to fight. <clears throat> We'd rather be in control of that. So we went around and looked online at other places. Um, we decided we came and visited each of the places. Um, we decided against Oak Hammock because that's not our, we, even though we lived, lived in Turkey Creek for some time, um, that's not our lifestyle. We were not country club people. Okay, um, have friends that love it there and it's perfect for them, but not us. The atrium, we felt hemmed in. I don't know if you've been there. Um, it's a lot, there are people we know that live there and it's perfect for them. I just felt like the ceilings and the walls were coming in on me. Um, now here, I don't need all this space now. I could do without it. But the expense of moving, uh, how much would I be saving? Anyway, we found this to be the perfect place. We thought about an apartment, and we thought about this. And one of Harold's nieces said, Uncle Harold, 
you need the cottage, you wouldn't be happy in another place. And that's true. I mean, she helped him decide, and then he had room for our, we had a car, which I just gave up a year and a half ago. Um, and he had his workspace there. He could put around the garage and do things that men like to do with tools and all. Um, this was the place for us. And if you've got space, you're going to fill it up. And I have. I've started unloading some of the stuff. My I've given some things away. My great grandson said he he liked this in his room. Those two, and I've emptied that one. But I think, what am I going to do with this stuff in here? But I don't need all this stuff. And if somebody wants it, good. He's 11, and they just have redone his room, new flooring and paint and all. And so he, he and his mother live with my daughter. So. Mm -hmm. Looking back in your life, um, how we started even our conversation, how, how many items you actually had 80 years ago, and okay, now. I don't now, but there is one thing one thing that was my grandparents when I was little, a lamp that I have. It needs to be rewired. I don't use it. But I've got it. And I you know, I don't want to part with it because it means a lot to me. It won't mean anything to anybody else. But when I was little, seeing it there in their, what would you call it, a Florida room, sitting room up north, I guess, um, I just liked having it. The other things, I've given away a lot of things just because if somebody wants them, they can have them. Things don't, what are things? People are what's important, and memories, and friends, and Harold was uh, head of maintenance, and the university president at that time said, we need new signs. And of course, the university has property all over the state, and they had to be signs that would hold up. So he got a, a committee together, people that he knew would be useful. And they tried all kinds of materials and lettering and what have you. And um, they came up with that. That the student had to be something the students couldn't wreck, couldn't get, take. Um, and that would hold up in the sun and all the other criteria. And that they could make them themselves. And they did. That material that it's on, the blue, of course, it's laminated, um, is what they use for petitions in the restrooms. It didn't fade. And, uh, and then they had to learn how they were going to attach all those things. So when he retired in 98, um, they presented that to him. So that's just a treasure to have, you know, it reminds me of how much he enjoyed all the people that work for him were family um, in their families. If one of their family was in the hospital somewhere, even Jacksonville, we went. Um, we prayed for our staffs before we went to work. They were all important. And he just had such a tremendous group of people. After he retired, one man called up and said, could he come and visit us? Well, this man had threatened his life. So Harold said, I want you in here with me. And the man came, and the man said, I want to apologize. He said, I've just become a Christian, and I'm dying. And I don't want this on my conscience. He said, I know I threatened you. 
he said, but why did you give me these difficult jobs? And so Harold said, it's because you were so better than anybody else at doing those jobs. Harold said it better than I'm saying. Um, and I, he handled it so beautifully, it just, and the man, you know, he realized why he got the, the tough jobs. Anyway, and the, the very few. I mean, he had very few people that were problems. He says, you're always going to have a problem. That keeps you on your toes. If everything goes perfectly, you're not going to do your best job. So, and you look familiar. I know I saw you the other day when you were there, but you do look like somebody I may have seen prior to that. Don't know where. Edith, we are nearing to the end of this interview, but is there anything that you wanted to talk about but I didn't ask you? Now I can't think of anything. Now I laid awake half the night <laughs> thinking of all these things. But no, because you answered, you asked the, so many good questions. You directed it so well. I'm not sure of anything. Oh, I might think of it tomorrow, but no. Okay, then I have a last question. Do you have any advice or a word of wisdom to the future generation or just the people that will watch your interview? Things are not important, people are. I've been thinking about that for a while for, for other reasons. I see people collecting things. It's so important to have all this, that and the other and they're not happy. I think you ought to treat other people com kindly, compassionately. Be sensitive to their needs. Forget about what's going on in your life. It'll work itself out. Care about the other person. Thank you. And thank you on behalf of Samuel Proctor Oral History Program at University of Florida. It's my pleasure. That was probably after their 50th anniversary. I'm sure it was. Maybe closer to their 60th. Um, and the one behind, uh, below it is my brother and his wife. Mm -hmm. Top left. And then the, and I'm in the bottom one. And that's Harold in his younger years in the top right. You shall see. Now that's my mother before they were married. That's in 1939. Now this one is when they were courting, and I don't know if you can get that at all. Um, oh, this is my parents' wedding picture. Oh, my parents, Kenneth and Helen Matthews. She was a Yasko. Of course, that's not the original name. What year do you think this picture was taken? 1930. Okay. Oh, this is Mother with that dog. Oh, um, and I have to think of the dog's name again. I said it earlier, but I can't think of it right now. Pepper? No, this was Cat. The cat was Pepper, oh, the cat was Pepper. but the dog was... Ooh, can't remember the dog's name right now. Oh yeah, I'll get my grandmother's birth certificate. Okay. Me in the sixth grade. It was the May May Day Maypole thing, and that's first time I had a formal. Well, it was homemade formal. Is that your house in the background? Um. 
No, it was <laughs> my uncle's office. We lived oh. in a garage apartment behind there. And my baby pictures. Come on. Oh, that's right. These are... Oh, they're laminated. Yes, we got it great. Thank okay. You. My dad playing his violin. He was about 90 years old. And he was excellent. He was as good as anybody I've ever heard, even if he was my father. He was a perfectionist. And uh, the friend he practiced with didn't want them to be recorded. And I do not have any recordings. That's me with my brother. You get my brother in there somehow. That's 1941. My brother and me. And on side, yeah. there's a person on the left corner. Oh, yeah, that's my dad. Really well. Mm -hmm. um, that's when my husband Harold and I were going together, and my father took that picture of us on campus. This too. That's great. Let's see if I can. That's a Polaroid, and Polaroids don't usually last. Now, this is the second marriage. Oh, yeah. second marriage. Okay. Yeah. Pastor and his wife and oh, yeah. my friend. Well, when you asked where my husband Harold was, the f history of his family, she just says the eastern store, shore of Virginia, mm -hmm. um, and then she's talked about Jamestown. Mm -hmm. In, uh, in 1622, anyway. Oh, and uh, my father is on that little trike and his two older sisters, the middle one passed when she yeah. was a teen. Uh, what what mm -hmm. year do you think that is? Like, okay. Um, well, he was born in 1906. What do you think? He's maybe four years old, mm -hmm. wow. somewhere there, about 1910. And then this is my grandmother's mother's mother's birth certificate from Poland. Mm -hmm. I'll let you hold that up. It says she arrived in the United States with J J Jimmy and Michael, June twenty fourth, nineteen o seven. Jimmy was about eight, Michael five. They were born in, I re pronounce that, Poland. Immigrated from La. So this is your great grandmother. This is from eighteen seventy one birth certificate. That's my grandmother, my mother's mother. Mm -hmm. And um, they came by way of Latvia on the SS Livonia to New York. Wow. So my mother's two older, oh, well, three older, because Mary. Okay, that's my mother's mother and my, her, her older daughter, who mother's older sister, who also was born in Poland. Mm-hmm. So, and I don't know, see the names, they changed their names. Mm -hmm. And so, there's Kovacek, Yasko, mm -hmm. Zavis, and I don't know, and Karnak, Karnackle, Karnackle, Karnackle. Zarnatska. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So, there's all those names. But their, their father, mother's father, came over first. And 
and then the family came later. So, my history of everything I could find. I went through scrapbooks, plastic totes. So your family place is between Białystok and Warsaw, which, okay. is, which is kind of on the eastern part of Poland. And my hometown is from here. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm.